So I'm going to talk about positivity and the representations of surface group. And this is a joint work with uh, Olivier Guichard and Anna Vinhart. So I guess you have some ideas of what representations of surface groups are. It just mean that you take the fundamental group of a surface of a closed, connected, oriented surface of genus G, G greater than two. This kind of a duck, which I drew in the previous uh, lecture. Uh, then I want to talk about positivity. So positivity is uh, both a an old and a very old and very new structure. So I'm going to spend some time uh, describing it. So a um, sorry, right. So um, uh, let's start with two examples of positivity. And, and uh, I'm going to give a, a proper definition at some point. But I'm going to start with two examples that uh, turned out that we like. So the first example is uh, the study of a convex curve in, uh, in the productive plane or in the plane. And uh, the other example is a, is a study of time-like curves in Rn1. So Rn1 is uh, the uh, 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 space equipped with a metric G, which is equal to, uh, sorry, which is equal to um, uh, dx uh, uh, one square plus dx uh, n square minus dx n plus one square. So this is a metric of uh, signature one n, and uh, the time lag curves they are the curves which a uh, uh, move like that. They are always um, of uh, type times, meaning that the ve tangent vector has a negative, is negative with respect to this quadratic form. So the question is why? Okay, so why am I interested in two, these two examples? And what do, what do they have in common? Okay, it turns out they have something in common, which is quite important, which is the fact that a a, they have some properties that we like. So here are the two properties that are shared by these two examples. The first one is a compactness property. So uh, imagine you have a sequence of uh, maps. So I put a star here, uh, which is this undefined property of positivity, which I'm going to define later. But uh, the, the properties that you like, if you have a sequence of such map, a sequence of convex curves, or a sequence of a, a time-like curve, then actually there is a subsequence that converges to a map which may not be exactly uh, having this property, like uh, strictly convex, but it's going to be still convex. And um, this is what I want to call a semi-star map, or it's going to be later a semi-positive map. So that's uh, one property that you like. And turned out that this property is a consequence of another property. And this other property is the following, uh, is that you have this extension property. So what does this extension property mean? That if you have a, um, if you have a, uh, a surface, a set sigma in S1, so I'm sorry, sigma is not necessarily a curve, is not necessarily a surface here. You have a countable set and you have a map which is convex, which is defined just on this countable subset, then you can extend it to a map, which is defined from S1 to S1, which might not be continuous, but which is going to be semi-continuous in some ways. Okay, so uh, that's something that uh, happens for these two examples, for convex curves. If you have a convex curve, if you have, which is, you have a convex set of points, uh, an order, then you can actually extend that to a whole continuous curve. So a, I'm going to be more precise again later. Don't worry. So here's a fundamental example of a positive map. So you take a cyclically ordered set, sigma, so which means that it's a, a subset of a, it's essentially S1 or Z mod uh, NZ, 
So you have a cyclic ordering and you now have S1 and you consider S1 as having the cyclic order and the space of maps, which are the basic examples of what I want to consider is the maps which are monotone, which is the map that preserve this order set here and here. Right? So this is a typical example of a, a positivity and positive maps. And you can see that you have this extension property that you can always extend a continuous, uh, a monotone map to a continuous map on the closure. This is a basic example of a what is a positive map. Right. So a, let's go a little more precise and think about ordering. So what is an ordering? An ordering is that you say that X is uh, greater than Y. So this means that you have a well-defined notion of pairs of point, which are pair order pair, X, Y, Y greater than X. And then the other thing that you like to do usually is to consider cyclic ordering. So what is a cyclic ordering? So now you can't say if on a circle, you can't say if X is greater than Y or Y greater than X. This is not something you can say, but you can say something about a triple. So meaning that uh, um, uh, you can say whether X, Y, Z is an order triple or not, okay? So that's definitely cyclic ordering is a property of a is a property of uh, of triple of points. So now here is another fact that a, you could want to define a cyclic ordering, but without a without a making a preference for the order, without choosing the order. So what do I mean by that? Uh, it means that uh, I want maybe X, Y, Z to be uh, order, but I want also to be Z, Y, X to be order. Okay. So uh, then you can see that all triples are, uh, are order with respect to that. So then it turns out that cyclic ordering without choosing the order is a property of quadruple of points. So let's uh, go back to uh, the example of a circle. So a cyclic order on uh, with I'm sorry, without uh, choosing the order is a on a set. So this is defined just by a set of nice quadruples. We are going to call them uh, positive quadruples. And of course, there is some axiomatic to be uh, satisfied by this quadruple in order that it makes sense. So you see that, for instance, I want to define the order quadrupole for a cyclic ordering without defining this order as one, two, three, four. So that's going to be a positive quadrupole, but so is four, three, two, one. So one example, one object which is not a, quad, a positive quadrupole is going to be one, three, two, four. Okay. So if you think of it, it's related to the property of the symmetry. So anyway, the notion of a cyclic ordering without choosing the order is to define what are positive quadruples and actually also what are positive triples. So now you can find a complicated way of defining what is a monotone map from S1 to S1. It's just a map that sends positive quadruples to positive quadruples. Okay, so I, what I want to emphasize in this short introduction is that positivity will be a property of quadruples and actually also of triples. Okay, so I need to define quadruple of points, positive quadruple of points, and positive triple of points. And of course, I want this to satisfy some nice axiomatic so that, it, so that you can have something. Okay, so a, for that, uh, this positive structure actually is going to live on some objects. And these objects are uh, called flag manifold. So I need to introduce a little bit. What are flag manifold? So uh, you start with a semi-simple group. So uh, I learned semi-simple group from Yves Benoit, and he always told me that a semi-simple group, you just have to think of SLNR, and everything that's true for SLNR is essentially true for any semi-simple group. So if you don't want to hear more, 
uh, think of SLMR. But in this a uh, in this uh, talk, since I will have to go into the finer structure of flag manifold, I will have to consider other objects. So, for instance, another example would be SO2n. So that's a group of isometries of a metric of signature 2n on the Euclidean space, on the, on the um, on Rn. And the other group which I will consider is a group, uh, the symplectic group, which is a group of a transformation of R2n, which preserves a symplectic structure, okay, an, a linear symplectic structure. So now let's move to the definition of a flag manifold, or it's actually uh, uh, called a generalized flag manifold, but we're going to stick to the definition of flag manifold to make, uh, to make uh, things sim simpler. So a flag manifold is a space X uh, with the following property, a topological space X with the following property. So the first thing is that X is compact. Okay. The second thing is that G acts transitively on X. So it turned out there are lots of homogeneous spaces uh, which are a compact and on which G acts transitively. For instance, for SLNR, there is a sphere, okay, SN, but there is also, I mean, the projective space, but there is also a G mod gamma, right? If you take a, a uniform lattice, G mod gamma, that's definitely a uh, compact space on which uh, G acts transitively. So to distinguish the flag manifolds, I have to uh, add an extra property, which is a dynamical one. So what is this uh, dynamical property? Is that there is just one element of, uh, of, there are several, but there is at least one element of G, which acts on X, of course. And, but this element has exactly one attracting fixed point, meaning that, I'm sorry, this is the attracting fixed point that is nearby here. You see that this point here is going to end up at this uh, point S. And you have one attracting fixed point, and you also have one repulsive fixed point, and this goes here. Okay, so that's the and definition. You mean no other fixed point? No, 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 no. I never said there are other, mm -hmm. other there, there could be other fixed point. So a, in exam, that's a very important example, actually. So if you take uh, uh, SN, and you consider the action which comes from the projective action of SLNR and SN, so, and if you take a diagonal element, so it will have one attractive fixed point. It will have actually two, uh, and then we'll have a repulsive fixed point in uh, RPN, but it will have other points which correspond to the other direction. On this point, these points are neither attractive nor repulsive. Okay, so what I mean here, uh, I should say that there are, there are some other fixed points of different type, but there are, as, as, as you, you are right to emphasize like this, there's exactly one attractive uh, fixed point, and there is exactly one repulsive fixed point. Okay, so this, the, the, you are right that for these points of fixed type, attracting on uh, repulsive, there is exactly one of those, but there are, might be other fixed points. And I say nothing about that. Okay, and so that's the uh, uh, dynamical definition, which I like because it's a very convenient. But there is also a, a very useful uh, algebraic definition, which is uh, in principle. But you need to know more the algebra than uh, what I'm going to need in that uh, talk. And the fact is that x uh, is going to be g mod p where P is a parabolic subgroup of G. So I don't want to explain what is a parabolic subgroup, but in the context of SLNR, this corresponds to a subgroup, which is a block, uh, uh, upper block, like that. So that's a subgroup of G, and that's a typical parabolic of SLNR. Okay? Okay, so let's give some examples of, uh, of a flag uh, manifold. And uh, so I'm going to give a little example. So the first example is the one that we like, which is S1. So S1 is also the projective line. 
and is a flag manifold with respect to the action of SL2R. Okay. So another example is the case of SLNR, and that's where the uh, notion of flags come from, that you can say, consider the space of flags in Rn, which are the, uh, so this is going to be the full flag actually by IT. So you take V1 inside V2, inside Vn minus one, and you impose as the dimension of Vi is exactly equal to I. So that's a full flag, I should say full, flag uh, manifold of Rn. So another example which is uh, going to be useful for us in the context of SP21R of the simplex D group. So that's uh, the space of Lagrangians in V omega. So Lagrangian subspace is a space which is exactly half the dimension and such that the restriction of a simplectic form is zero on this space. Okay, so this space is called the, well, actually it has some of the name, which is uh, Schiller boundary, but uh, let's forget about that. It's just a space of Lagrangian subspace in the omega. So let's uh, uh, um, define another, uh, so SP2NR as other flag manifold, but this is the one I'm going to be concentrating on. And for SON2, which is one of my favorite groups, you have a flag manifold, which is called the Einstein space. It's called the Einstein space, which is, it is related to, to Minkowski, uh, Minkowski geometry. So what is this uh, space? It's just a uh, uh, space of uh, lines in, uh, in uh, Rn2, such that the uh, quadratic form is zero on this, uh, on this line, okay? And this line is, uh, so it, it, you can see it as a space of vectors, which are non-zero, but the quadratic form of a theater N2 here is zero on it. And you divide it, you identify two such vectors whenever they are proportional. So that's a, an important object, which is called the Einstein universe. Okay. So uh, now let's explain a important structures about a about flag manifold. So one important structure is so this is a little bit small. One important structure is a, the notion of transversality, right? So in some of the flag manifolds whenever the, the parabolic is conjugate to this opposite. So there is a notion of transversality, right? So let's explain example of transversality. So this is a property of pair of points. So again, I have to move from pair of points to quadrupole of points, to triple of points, to quadrupole of points. So what is this property of transversality? So I'm just going to give it in examples. And the example, which are the one I gave before, so if I take S1, so you just say that X is transverse to Y, is if it, it is just the fact that X is different from Y. So it's a very simple property of transversality. Then there is another notion of transversality, this full, full flag manifold. So remember you have this uh, flag, which is a line in a plane, in a three space, in a four space and so on. And you have two such flags. So why, when do you say that this full, two such full flags are transverse? Just say that uh, VI plus W of the, the W part, the part of, of W, which is a dimension N minus Y, the sum of these two is precisely a direct sum. So that's another notion of transversality. So you see in these two examples that given X, the set of those guys which are transverse to it, this is an open set. Okay, so the notion of transversity for Lagrangian is actually very simple. Just say that two Lagrangians are transverse whenever uh, they are in direct sum. So again, it's an open condition. So finally, for a uh, the Einstein universe, which is correspond to two lines, which is generated by a vector, 
So the property is that it should exist any two vector non-zero vector in L0 on any two vector uh, any vector in L0 which is non-zero any vector in L1 which is non-zero then the product the scalar product of these two is non-zero. So that's a notion of transversality in the Einstein universe. And uh, you see that uh, this is again a uh, uh, um, an open uh, condition. So here is now a very important result, which is to say that what is the space of transversal pairs? And it turns out that if I consider a point X, right? If I consider all those guys which are transverse to X, so I emphasized before in the example that this set is a, an open set, but the important property now from that you get from this algebraic definition of uh, parabolic is that this set is a ball, okay? And this set is called usually the big Schubert cell in your flag manifold, okay? But for us, this is the uh, set of those y which has transverse to x. Okay, so just wanted to say something about pair of pairs. So let's a uh, let's uh, give an extra example, which is which uh, which is sort of interesting, um, uh, which is um, this case of the Einstein universe. Right. So um, I'm going to give uh, closer to the first, the second example I gave in the beginning. So it turned out the Einstein universe has a conformal structure, meaning it has a well-defined metric, but only up to homotopy. And it turned out that this metric is not a Riemannian metric. It is a, um, a signature. It is a, so has, okay. So let's uh, write it here. So Einstein has a, a N1 simple, uh, conformal structure. Um, it has slightly more than that. So meaning that you have uh, naturally uh, light cones and uh, these light cones, you can describe it, them using the transversality property. On these light cones through X, uh, these are exactly those guys Y, which are not transverse to Y. So if you remove these light cones, you opt on the Einstein universe, you obtain a the big uh, the big Schubert cell. So it's kind of bizarre to see that this is a ball, but it turned out that this is connected to this one, and this is connected to this one. So it's actually a not uh, not easy exercise, but uh, because it's a lot of gymnastic in your mind. So that uh, this is a uh, this is a big Schubert cell, right? So now here is a final observation, which is quite important: that you cannot distinguish anything. You cannot say anything about pair of pants. I mean, uh, more than that, in the sense that G acts transitively on the space of transverse points and points I call them parabolics. Okay, so here's a property that uh, this this sort of transversality somehow exhausts what you can say about pair of pair of points. They are all the same pair of transverse points. They are all the same with respect to the action of G. Right. Okay, so now now then, no, let's move to triple of points. So that's where things are going to be interesting. So now imagine you take three points in uh, your flag manifold and they are pairwise transverse. So for instance, you have the big Schubert cell associated uh, to X, you have the big uh, Schubert cell associated to Y, and then you may consider the intersection of uh, this ball with this ball. So it turned out that now um, this object have a very different that they have several the uh, connected components and they are 
a very different. So what is positivity? Again, I'm going to derive a much more precise definition later. So positivity is about choosing such components or positive triples. So let's explain in one example what it is. So we go back to this example of, of uh, SL3R. And uh, I see that Seyong Choi is here, so he's going to explain you a lot about the uh, uh, projective plane. So if you take a SL3R and you take um, um, three, uh, three flags, so what is a flag? It's a point in the projective plane on a line in the projective plane. Okay, so uh, this triple is positive, is going to be positive if there exists a convex curve that goes uh, through the three point and which is tangent to L0 at X0 and tangent to X1 at L1, tangent to L1 at X1 and tangent to L2 at X2. So this is a property of triples and you can, you, it's not, it's a bit hard to see, but if you think about it, you can see that if you take another triple, there are triples which are not positive. There are triples which are positive, and there are triples which are not positive. Okay, so it turned out that uh, for uh, this point in the flag manifold to be so that this is a positive triple in that sense, it's exactly like being in some specific component of the intersection of these two Schubert cells. Okay. So uh, let's again do examples. So the example I want to uh, to emphasize is the case of SO2 and 2. And I said before that the Einstein universe uh, had this um, um, conformal structure of type 1n. So you have these light cones. So in that example, so x, y, z, is going to be, so these are elements of the Einstein universe, they are going to be positive if Y belongs to a diamond. So what is a diamond? It's the intersection of these two, the future of X and the past of Z, and they intersect in some object. And to be positive is to say that X, Y, Z, it, 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 Y belongs to uh, the intersection, Y is in the future of X and the past of Z. So that's being positive. So now what is positivity for a last example? So what is positivity for uh, um, in the case of the simplicity group? So here you have to take a free Lagrangian. And when you have free Lagrangian which are pairwise transverse, this means that L2 is going to be a graph of a map from L0 to L1. And it turns out that uh, of a linear map, and the fact that it is Lagrangian means that this um, omega of x f y is a quadratic form. Okay, so uh, if L two is transverse to L one and L zero, it's a quadratic form which is a non-degenerate of a signature n p. So now you have the theorem of a Sylvester, I think which, uh, which uh, characterize the quadratic form, which, has non which, which are non-degenerated by the signature. And to be positive is exactly that this quadratic form defined by L2 is a positive definite or positive ne ne uh, of negative definite. Okay. And the, the positive or negative just comes from some orientation. It's not a big deal. Okay, so these are three examples of positivity for SL3R, for SO2N, and for the simplex group. I've defined what are positive triples. So a, now let's uh, give a geometric definition of positivity. So uh, you say a flag manifold admits a positive structure if one can choose in a G equivalent way specific components of OX of the intersection of, of two Schubert cells, which I want to call diamonds, because I've keep in mind this idea of this uh, future of X and the past of Y to intersect in some object which looks like a diamond. And this, a, the 
how do you characterize which diamond you want to take? Because which are the nice diamonds? They satisfy a nesting condition. This is a very important condition. So this nesting condition say that if you take X on Y, if you take Z in a diamond defined by X and Y, then there exists a diamond with uh, associated to Z on Y, and this diamond is strictly inside uh, the, uh, the diamond defined by X and Y. Okay, so there's a very simple geometric idea, which is that this there exists a given Z which lies in the diamond delta of X and Y, then there exists a diamond delta of ZY which lies in delta of xy. Okay, so if you think again of the case of uh, the Einstein universe, with this notion of future and past, you see that's exactly the property uh, that you like about positivity, meaning that, uh, right, it looks like that. So that uh, z, in that context, z is in the future of x and the past of y, but on the other end, there exists a set of points which are both in the future of Z and in the past of Y, and, but they are also in the future of X. Okay? So that's the property that defines you positivity. And this property is this very simple nesting property from a geometric point of view. So it turned out that this, a, again, so this I've tried to be um, uh, as geometric as possible, but you can define this property of positivity and as a property of a uh, from uh, the algebraic point of view in terms of parabolics and unipotence part of the parabolics. So okay, but if you do that, so actually I should have said that this definition of positivity of understanding of positivity is a definition due to Guichard and Pinard, and this sort of supersedes uh, previous notion. And uh, there was this notion of lustic positivity, which is related to uh, SLNR, and uh, works for Hitchin and more generally all spin group. And this was used a lot by Fokon and Charov. And then there is this notion of Schiller van der Ries, uh, which is a case of uh, Hermitian symmetry group, like a SO2N or a simplex group. And this was used a lot by Burger, uh, Yotzi, and Vinhart. And but there are actually new examples. Um, uh, Guichard and Vinard are, have actually classified all what are all the positive all the positive structures that you can uh, obtain, meaning that they have classified which group, which flag manifolds, and what are the sort of diamonds that you have uh, in this picture. So uh, their uh, result also give uh, extra information about this positive structure that I'm going to use secretly later. Okay. So I've explained what is a positive triple. Now I want to explain what is a positive quadrupole. So are there some questions so far? All good? So you are happy with the definition of positive triples, whatever they, whatever they are? But the important fact is that the set of positive triple, well, let's, let's, let's go here. The set of positive triple with respect to X and Y has several connected components. Each such connected component is called a diamond. And this a notion of diamond as a nesting property, meaning that if Z is inside a diamond defined by X and Y, then there exists a diamond defined by Z and Y, which lies totally in the diamond defined by X and Y. Okay, this is the property of positivity. Imposing what are positive triples, construct diamonds which are connected components of positive triples, and uh, then imposing that nesting condition. So now let's uh, define, a, let's go back to positive quadruples. I said that we have to define what are positive quadruples. So what is a positive quadruple? So first, x1, x2, x3, x4. So the first condition is that all subtriples, 
all subtriples are positive. Okay, so x1, x2, x3 is positive, x3, x4 is positive, and uh, x4, uh, x2, x1 is positive. So all the positive triples, positive a subset, triples are positive. Okay, I should I say something about important about positive triples? Maybe I write it here. So to be positive, or triples is invariant under the group sigma three. So it means that if x y z is positive then uh, z y x is positive also this is a uh, this is something that uh, bugs people minds because they say oh okay if x y z is positive then obviously z y x is negative no uh, the notion of positivity is uh, not uh, is really invariant to the sigma three right so part of the definition, part of the first property is to prove that this with this notion of positivity, then x, y, z is positive, then z, y, x is positive. So for instance, the third rule, positivity, every triple is positive, okay, provided that it's a pairwise, all the uh, guys are pairwise distinct, okay? Right. So what is the property now of, uh, of uh, being a positive quadruple? Okay, uh, right. So uh, x x one x three x four is a positive quadrupole, so it determines a diamond. Uh, so that x three is inside that. Okay, so the uh, condition about positivity of quadrupoles, then you require that x two is actually inside this diamond, okay? And furthermore, you require that the sub-diamonds here is included in this big diamond here. And this small diamond here is included in the big diamond, and this diamond here, all the sub-diamonds that you consider here are included in the big diamonds. Okay? So that's a, not an empty condition, and um, you can see that is a property that works precisely for uh, this, nicely for this, for a, a circle. Sorry, maybe it should another color. So you have x1, x2. So you fix a, the diamond between x1 and x2. So it's just going to be uh, the interval, uh, a choice of in an interval between x1 and x2. I'm sorry, this is x4, an interval between x1 and x4, then you impose uh, that uh, x2 uh, is uh, in this, uh, in this uh, interval. So you don't want x2 to be here. You want x2 to be uh, in this diamond between x1 and x4. Sorry, this is a diamond between x1 and x4. But furthermore, you actually want to impose that it lies in this sub-interval, okay? And x2 has to be here. And you see that you have uh, this uh, property, this kind of Burlington socks uh, properties, which is that, uh, indeed, the interval between x1 and x2, this is inside the interval between x1 and x3, this one's be between uh, inside the preferred interval between x1 and x4. On this interval here is inside this big one. On this one here is also inside this this one here, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is the property of being a positive quadrupole that you have this kind of a uh, nesting properties for this object. So is that clear? It's a kind of a combinatoric object. But it's it's it, it turned out that this is very easy to manipulate. Okay, so now uh, I said before that if you have a positive triple, then any permutation of the point is also a positive triple. So that's not the case for positive quadruple. 
So uh, what happened is that uh, first you have a cyclic transformation that preserves the positivity. Again, that's not an obvious property. That comes from the, uh, it's not an obvious property from the definition I gave, but it is true that if x1, x2, x3, x4 is positive, then x4, x1, x2, x3 is positive. So that's a property which is invariant by cyclic transformation. Another property which is kind of obvious, which what I said is that if x1, x2, x3, x4 is positive, then x4, x3, x2, x1 is positive. So this is a property which is in, invariant by uh, reversing of the orientation. But that's all. And a, if you take any other transformation, and uh, there exists because the group generated by cyclic transformation on uh, on reversing orientation. This is not the whole symmetric group of S four, and uh, there are uh, positive there are uh, quadrupoles which are not positive, and which have uh, so there is for, uh, more precisely x one x three x two x four is not a positive quadrupole. Okay. Right. So a, here is a definition of what is a positive map from sigma. So sigma here is a countable cyclical, a countable subset of S1 or a S1. It's any subset of S1. So you want to say that a map from S1 to my flag manifold is positive. If it's a cyclically, uh, cyclically ordered quadrupoles to positive quadrupoles. Okay, so now comes the big a uh, property that this notion of positivity. Uh, uh, yeah, you have to think of diamonds as the same thing as in some sort of a generalized intervals. And uh, this set, the set of those positive maps satisfy some compactness property. So the compactness property is going to be reminiscent of the properties that we started from, for the case of a, uh, of a convex curves on of uh, time-like curves, meaning that you could, op you could obtain something which is weakly positive, like you have a convex curves and you have something which is uh, not strictly convex and you have a monotone map which uh, semi-monotone map meaning that it is increasing and then suddenly it becomes a constant at some point okay but nevertheless you have a compactness property for the space of positive map and uh, this comes from the fact that you have this extension property that if you have a positive map which is defined on some smaller set, which is dense, you can extend it to the closure of the set. And you have this extension property, which is very important to get this compactness property. Right. So now uh, you can define easily uh, what is a what is a positive representation. So you just say that a positive representation is a, a representation of a surface group into G uh, is positive with respect to the positive structure defined on S, sorry. If, if what? If there exists a rho equivalent positive map Xi from the boundary at infinity of the surface, which looks like a circle, okay? And which is home, I mean, which is homeomorphic to a circle to this flag manifold F. So positivity for representation is about the existence of a positive map, which is rho equivalent, that's where the representation appears, from this object to the flag manifold. So we need to send positive quadruples here to positive quadruples here. And we will see there are lots of examples of a positive representation. The first one is the representation that comes from the monodromy of hyperbolic uh, surface. 
So if you think about the monodromy of hyperbolic surfaces of the uh, holonomy representation of the hyperbolic surface, so you have the boundary at infinity, which is a circle, and you have this F here, which is a projective line. So those representations which come from Teichmuller theory, these are exactly those representation for which there exists a row equivalent monotone map for positive. Now we know that these are positive from the boundary at infinity of your surface group to the uh, projective line. Okay. So that's the definition of positivity is meant to extend the definition of Teichmuller states. And there is some beautiful uh, results that you know, which is due to Goldman, which is the fact that um, given a, uh, maybe I should add, I should uh, state here, so there's a theorem, which is due to Goldman, which is that the uh, space of holodomies of hyperbolic structure uh, uh, is so you see that is a union actually two to connected components of the space of representation of this representation of pi one of s into the group PSL two. Right. So. Uh, um, uh, what I want to say here is that this is the prototype of the theorem that we want to prove that uh, there exists a connected component of the space of representation which consists entirely of a positive uh, maps, a positive representation. So this object, we identify them as positive structures, positive representation, and there exists a uh, in this form an entire connected components of the space of positive representation. So here is a um, result, which is the main result of this paper with uh, Guichard, uh, myself, on Anna Wienert, which is the following, that a positive representation is Anosov. So I'm going to explain a little bit what does a Anosov representation means. And uh, more important, and that this uses this first property, is that the set of positive representation is a union of connected components of representation. So here there is an extra uh, hypothesis, which say that they do not factor through parabolic. So let's say, um, okay, so um, let's uh, give a little more information about this uh, uh, extra hypothesis. Uh, so two facts. So this condition of being a, uh, a do not factor through a parabolic exactly correspond to the notion when you take representation in SLNR, which are irreducible representations. Okay, so this notion of do not factoring through a parabolic is exactly the same notion of being a irreducible representation. So uh, it turned out that uh, I don't have the latest version of my notes. I'm sorry about that. That uh, right. So I need to sorry. Uh, it turned out that uh, done by some by a, a recent result of uh, Jonas Bayer, uh, 
uh, Olivier Guichard, myself, Pozzetti, Beatrice Pozzetti, and Anna Finard. I'm sorry, I'm uh, in heart. Then um, this uh, condition is not necessarily anymore. So uh, it turned out that uh, the set of positive representation using this result is actually a union of cognitive components of representations without any extra condition. Okay, so I need to explain a little bit what do I mean by a being another property. What is the another property? So uh, this would require maybe more time than I have. So let me explain, try to explain what is an another subgroup in a semi-symbol group G. So the first thing is that you 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 it's nice to have an extra structure on the group itself. So let's just consider it's a hyperbolic group. Okay. So uh, abstractly, it's a hyperbolic group. It's a finitely generated uh, hyperbolic group. So now you have a flag manifold, and you want to define what is a F anosov subgroup. So to be anosov is related again to a flag manifold in G. So the condition is the following. So uh, let's say uh, here. So let's uh, first define what is a F loxodromic element. So an F loxodromic means that exactly you have this property of uh, acting with exactly one attractive fixed point on exactly one repulsive fixed point, but may be other fixed point. So let's let's define this property to be F, loxo F loxodromic. And the first property is that any element gamma in gamma is actually F loxodromic. So now uh, you want to say something that they are the group itself, not just the element, is a loxodromic in a uniform way. So you want to say that the, the rate of attraction on the rate of uh, dilation is actually only depends on the uh, element in the group and only depends on the word length of the group. So uh, in some way, you have all elements are loxodromic, but furthermore, the, this loxodromic property is a, only depends on the word length and behave nicely with respect to the word length. So that's one of the definitions. The original definition is related to a dynamics uh, associated to hyperbolic groups. So um, I prefer the uh, original definition, but for this purpose here, maybe it's easier to say that every element acts in a loxodromic way, and the way it acts is controlled by the word length. Of the group. So, uh, so why are we interested in two in uh, another subgroup? Because they have lots of nice properties, and. Uh, one of the properties is that you have limit curves, which are mapped from the boundary at infinity to uh, the uh, flag manifold. The other property is this property of stability. If you start with a Nanosov subgroup, if you perform, if you deform it a little bit, and it's still an Nanosov property, and you can talk about entropies and all this stuff. Okay, so where does this another property come from? It comes from a, the fact that actually, if you fix a positive triple x w t, then uh, you can you can uh, associate to such a positive triple a diamond which depends on w on this uh, on this uh, a metric. I'm sorry, a metric, uh, a Riemannian metric on this diamond x and y and uh, the property which is quite important to define this property which is you have, need to have some qualitative nesting so what does this qualitative um, uh, uh, nesting means it means that if you uh, if you take the metric which is defined by um, uh, 
uh, W on X on Y, this metric is actually uh, smaller than half the metric defined by Z on T, provided that you have some uh, uh, nice property of the quintuple X, Z, Y, uh, uh, X, Z, Y, T, Y. Okay, so you need to have some qualitative, uh, sorry, quantitative nesting property, meaning that you have a contraction from this metric to this metric. So once you have proven this property, you can sort of get uh, this a, another property. And uh, the other part is this, uh, this is to define, to show that this is a closed subset in this, uh, an open subset in a set of opposition, because as I said, another property is a stable property. And the other property is to use a compactness theorem. And the compactness theorem is quite important, which is to say that if, oops, la, if you have a sequence of a, a positive representations that converge to representation, you of course want to say that this limit object representation is positive. So first thing that you have this limit map, by definition, this limit map is uh, uh, positive. And now you have your property of compactness of positive map, which tell you that this map here is going to be a semi-positive map. I don't know what, what it is, but again, you think of this that like, like a limit of uh, monotone maps can be a monotone path, but some, some pieces it might be constant. Okay, so the uh, property uh, that you, uh, you want to show is first that you have three points so that these three elements are pairwise transverse. That is implies positivity. And uh, you need some lemma uh, to, uh, to show that if all those guys are not pairwise transverse, then um, if uh, you can show uh, that uh, for all guy which are converse to x, uh, psi of zero is not converse, uh, then this implies that at the rho factors were parabolic. So this is a purely algebraic statement. But it turned out with this new result of a, with Bayer and Rossetti, with this extra author, which relies on some fault of polar lemma, then we can get rid of this uh, property and uh, obtain a compactness theorem without this, uh, meaning that you have a sequence of positive representation converging to a, a representation, and the limit is going to always be positive without imposing this extra condition of factoring through a parabolic, which is here. Okay, so I think I'm, uh, I'm done. And uh, I would like to, um, yeah, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention and maybe uh, go back to this uh, quite important, uh, uh, finish by this quite important uh, uh, picture, which is a definition of a positive quadrupoles. Okay, thank you for your attention.